as uh, as is usual for the Wednesday morning classes, I record audio. I also record video. I hope that people will still be comfortable having their screens on because for me, it's much better if I'm talking to people as opposed to talking to, uh, to blank screens. Um, thank you very much for joining our five-part series, The Biblical Battlefields of Israel. Um, for those who did not yet get a chance to register, um, please do take care of registering. Um, and um, that way you'll also get the email follow-up from the session with a link to the recording. Um, I'm also planning now our June series. Um, as has been our tradition, the June series is something a little different. It's also free of charge. Um, and the session will be Giants of Sephardic Jewry be a blend of uh, history and philosophy. I'm going to send out uh, you know, a flyer and so on eventually, but just letting you know to plan for Wednesdays in June, it'll be a four-part series, God willing, and we'll talk more about that. Um, other notes? Yes, um, next week, God willing, every evening next week will be a special class, a special program as part of a week-long theme from my Beit Midrash. The theme is After Disaster, Lessons in Reinvention from Rabbi Akiva. It's gonna start with a panel discussion on Sunday evening um, about conversion and conversion as reinvention. And we'll be talking to two local rabbis, Rabbi Daniel Karabkin and Rabbi Chaim Strauchler, as well as Rebetzin Abby Lerner, who is the Director of Conversion Services for the Rabbinical Council of America, and Greg Ting, who himself converted to Judaism. That'll be Sunday evening. And then we'll have sessions all through the week, all centered on the theme of reinvention as seen through the life and experiences and teachings of Rabbi Akiva. So I'll probably send out the flyer when I send out the follow-up email um, later, uh, later today. It would be great to see you there. The entire program is free of charge and like everything else, available on Zoom. Okay. So we're talking about- Does biblical, it require registration? There is no registration required at all. No, okay. So the, um, yeah, when I, when I sent out the promotion originally for this series on battlefields, I got an email back from somebody who didn't wanna talk about war and doesn't wanna, you know, does, doesn't wanna deal with the, the moral issues, the ethical issues, and so on that that relate to it. So we're not really going to be spending time on that in this series. I did give you a link at the top of the source sheet. Um, the uh, I'm putting the link again for the source sheet in the chat. Um, that's a link to a series we did back in 2014 on war and morality. So if you click on that link, you will be able to hear several sessions on that topic, but that's not our topic for, uh, for now. What we're going to do is look at five battlefields, realistically probably four. <laughs> I'm assuming we're not getting to the fifth, but I'm ready for it if we do. Um, and the five are the ones that I listed for you on the, the source sheet. Jericho is first. That's the one we're going to focus on today from Joshua chapter six. Um, then Ayalon, which is the site of a battle that the Jews had to defend a Canaanite tribe, the Chivi, in uh, Joshua chapter 10. Then Kishon, the site of a war the Jews fought to overthrow their Canaanite oppressors. That's in the book of Judges, chapters four and five. The chapter five, there is the song of the prophet and judge Devorah. That'll be followed by Elah, which was the place of the duel between David and Goliath in the book of Samuel. And then if we get there, the Mount of Olives, which is the site of a future battle, the battle for Jerusalem right before the arrival of Mashiach, of the Messiah, um, in Zechariah chapter 14. That's what I, wanna, what I wanna talk about. But let me ask you a question. What's the value in studying battles and battlefields of the past? What's the benefit? Marilyn, you're muted. It might be predictions of what could happen in the future. Lessons for the future. George Santayana chiming in from Mexico. Yes, indeed. That's one possibility. Um, yeah, Rose. I think we have to understand and know our own history. So by doing battlefields, we have to, we understand history and you don't know 
where you're going unless you know where you come from. Right. So you need to know your roots along the lines also of where Ian was going. I think Esther. Uh, be, uh, how I'd like, I think we want to study the behavior of these uh, battlefields. How did we as Jews behave? I think, or how we should behave. We might see some insight there. Lessons in behavior. So all of these, I think, are important points. If you take a look on the sheet at source number one, you'll see something which I think relates to that. This is an essay by a fellow by the name of Bruce Prideau uh, from Australia. It's called Echoes of War, Battlefield Tourism an essay in a book that's actually called Battlefield Tourism. And you look at what he says here. He says, battlefields are poignant reminders of humans' inability to live at peace with neighbors and a statement of the selfishness of individuals and nations who seek to take what is not theirs through aggression. Moreover, they are also a testimony to those who make a stand against tyranny and injustice sometimes at the expense of their own lives. Battlefields are also reminders of the past and for some are the places where national pride was born or national disgrace was suffered. Battlefields also exhibit a number of dimensions including the battlefield itself, measurement of the outcomes on the victor and the vanquished, the impact on participants and the consequences on their family and friends. Now, there's a lot there obviously, um, what, uh, what Prudeau is telling us. But battlefields are reminders of villainy and heroism in the actions of the two sides. And they're important reminders, right? Inevitably, I imagine I'm not the only one who has to be moved to think about in Flanders Fields and the poppies, right? As, uh, as part of this, the poem that calls people to be faithful to those who fell. Um, reminders of moments of national honor and disgrace in the conduct of the two sides. And as he says, measurements of the outcomes and impacts of the battle. Some of these are going to be more relevant in certain battlefields that we're going to see, and some of them are going to be less relevant. We're going to see, we're talking about different kinds of wars as part of our conversation. But certainly, what, what you're seeing here in, uh, in Prideau's paragraph that I excerpted from the, from the piece is the, um, the, the reminder of what we did and what others did as a lesson to us on a personal level as well as a national level. And it helps to gauge the outcome and the impact of that, uh, of that battle. That's all one dimension to it. But I want to call your attention to another dimension here, because it's not only about that. Battlefields with their physical features carry a special meaning in Judaism because place matters in Judaism. Location matters in Judaism. In Torah, the place where an event occurs is seen as significant in and of itself. So I'll give you an example of that. The Torah is given at Mount Sinai in a midbar. Midbar is often translated desert. Sometimes it means wilderness. Take a look at what the Talmud does with that in source number two. It says, a person who renders himself like a wilderness, open to all, meaning that they are humble, as I put in brackets, such a person is given Torah as a gift. It's built around a verse in the book of Numbers. I'm not going into the specific verse right now. That's not my point. My point is that the Talmud says we're supposed to learn something from the place where the Torah was given. That's supposed to have significance to us. There's another classic lesson that we learn from the place where the Torah was given. Anybody know it about Mount Sinai? about the nature of Mount Sinai. We're coming towards the holiday of Shavuot, slowly, slowly getting there. The, um, it was the second highest mountain. It wasn't the greatest. Right, not the second highest, but actually the lowest as the Talmud yeah. tells the story. I think you're thinking of something else, which, which I'll mention since you pointed out. But we're told that Mount Sinai is the lowest mountain and that the Torah is given there again as a lesson in humility. The other point that Mark makes is that we're taught that the mountain that the, uh, that the temple is built on 
is not the highest peak, but the second highest peak in its area. The, um, and the Talmud says that's also a lesson in humility. Location, location, location. In Judaism, location really matters. The place where something takes place is more than just the background. It's actually a player in and of itself. You know where this becomes exceeding, uh, extremely important? The laws of Shabbat. Tell me something. What is an Eruv? What? An it's, a fence. An it's a fence. It's an artificial fence or a fence around something to protect you, so to speak. Right. So the word Eruv literally means a mixture. The What we call an Eruv is a boundary around a location. I saw Brenda... Mm -hmm you know, making the, uh, the boundary gesture there that's going around the area, combining all of the properties that are within it to be a single space. That's what an Eruv does. A lot of technical things that we're not going to go into right now, but that's the goal of an Eruv. We need that in Jewish law because we're taught that on Shabbat, we're not to transport items from inside the house to out of the house, or outside the house to inside the house, right? I'm not supposed to transport in a public domain more than four cubits, and I'm not supposed to transport between domains, which leads to a question. The things I'm not supposed to do on Shabbat are forms of creative work. So I don't light a fire, right? I don't write. I'm not supposed to build. How is it that if I walk out the door with something in my pocket, I have done a creative act. Where is the creative act in walking outside the house with something in my pocket? Rabbinic commentator, yes, Esther. Sorry, you were going to say? You take something from, uh, from a private domain to a public domain, which is outside the house. Yeah, but why is that a creative act? You're carrying. Carrying. Okay, I'm carrying. That's nice, but that didn't do anything. You know, mm -hmm. I picked up I picked up something here. Uh, oh, not a pencil, because it's Shabbat now. But I picked up a bottle of water and I moved it over there. In what way did I do anything of significance? You changed the space, the location. I changed the location, and the location matters. Rabbinical commentaries talk about this. They call the, the prohibited act of transport on Shabbat melacha girua. It's an inferior form of work. It's not as clear that it's prohibited as, as other things. But the answer is that location matters. Um, one of my children used this for their, their speech at their bat mitzvah. If you take a look at source number three, look at this. This is how the Talmud gives you the law about transporting between domains. It says, if a pauper stands outside the house and the balabayit, the homeowner, is inside and the pauper extends his hand inward and places something into the hand of the homeowner, so he transported something, or takes something from the homeowner and removes it, then the pauper is liable for having moved something across the boundary, the homeowner is exempt. And vice versa. If the homeowner is the one who extended the prop, the, the item outside, then the homeowner is the one who's liable. My point is not the law. My point is that normally, if I were writing this, I would have said something like, if Reuven and Shimon are standing and one is inside and one is outside and Reuven gives something to Shimon or Shimon gives something to Reuven and Reuven takes something from Shimon, that's what I would have done. I would have given them names. That's not what the Talmud does in this Mishnah. It gives them identities instead as a pauper and a homeowner. By dint of being the one who is inside, you are a landlord. You are a homeowner. You're someone of substance. By dint of being the person outside who is putting a hand in, that must be the pauper, the person who is in need. They don't have a house. You follow what I'm saying? The idea is that your location helps define your identity. And taking that back to the battlefield, the places where the battlefields take place, those locations have an identity of their own. 
So we're going to see in the course of the sessions that we have over the course of the series, not only the battles, but the physical locations. Jericho is a walled city. Ayalon is a valley. Kishon is a wadi. We're going to look at these areas and ask what messages do the locations of the battles have for us, the actual battlefields. But I also want to see a third dimension. These are biblical battles. And biblical battles tend to involve miracles, God intervening to do something. So that if you look back at the top of the sheet where I listed the five battlefields, you have Jericho where the walls collapse, Ayalon where it seems like the sun and the moon halt. I wrote a question mark because that's not so clear as we'll discuss. Kishon, there's a flash flood in the Wadi that disables the Canaanite chariots. At Elah, of course, David casts this stone at Goliath and this mighty giant is, uh, is defeated by the stone. And then the Mount of Olives, there's an earthquake that splits the mountain open and a river floods forth from Jerusalem. So I want to know about those miracles and the messages they carry as well. So in our series, in which we're going to celebrate Israel's 73rd birthday by looking at these battlefields, I want to use these stories to accomplish three goals. To learn about the battles and their lessons, to understand the philosophical... Rabbi, I can't hear you. Uh-oh. And anybody else can't, can't hear you? Me? No, everybody else, no, everyone else does. Dahlia, it's your... Uh, Sorry, Dahlia. Name. The, um, the speaker. The, the, so first, to, to learn about the biblical battles and their lessons. Second, to understand the philosophical messages that are communicated via the physical features of the battlefields. And third, to explore the messages conveyed by the miracles that occur in each war. I would love to say we'd also spend some time on archaeology, but that ain't happening, which is too bad because <laughs> that's fascinating in its own right. Um, but let's be ambitious and try for the other three. And I think that if we can do that, we'll have accomplished a great deal. Okay, are we on board? All right. The, uh, I know that this is, uh, this is gonna be somewhat challenging and that we're doing a little Tanakh, a little geography, a little philosophy, um, but I, hopefully what will emerge will be something, uh, something helpful. So if you look at your sheet at source number four, you'll see there, um, four links. Um, I've taught the book of Joshua, you know, beginning to end, and the recordings are online. And in that series, um, four sessions were devoted to the battle with Jericho itself. So those are links to the four sessions. If you want to know more about the story of the battle in, uh, in Jericho, um, you can always just um, listen to the audios there. It's all free. And that'll be more information than we're going to get to today because we're going to go through the story of the battle, but we're not going to go through it in, uh, in, in significant depth. It, like you see there, it took four hours uh, for me to do just the story of the battle um, when I did it as part of a, a year-long series. So the, um, introducing the story, the context for this, the Jews have just entered the land that had been Canaan, that is now supposed to become Eretz Yisrael, led by Joshua. <laughs> At this point in the book of Joshua, the Jews have sent spies into, the, into Jericho, and they learned that the city is quaking in fear from the invading Jews. That gives the Jews something of a, a boost. We'll talk more about the mission of the spies as we go along. The Jews have reclaimed their national heritage. They performed circumcision because while they were traveling in the wilderness, they did not um, circumcise themselves. There was a fear that at any point they might need to travel and those who had undergone the Brit Milah um, would be endangered. So they did not circumcise while they were traveling. Now they did it. They celebrated Pesach and they ate finally from the produce of the land, right? Remember that the Jews until this point 
have the mana that falls from the skies. And even after they enter the land, they have some that remains in their vessels. So now they stop all of that. Now we are truly Israeli. We have reclaimed our heritage. Circumcision, which came from Abraham, is now being practiced by the Jews in the land where Abraham first practiced it. They're celebrating the Karban Pesach, the Pesach sacrifice that marks the departure from Egypt. They're eating the produce of their own land. The mission of the Jews in this land is what? What are the Jews supposed to accomplish in this new land? Take over and then run it and grow their own food and, and get rid of all the people. Part of the thing was to get rid of everybody who wasn't Jewish, who wasn't Israel. <laughs> So, so I accept what Susan is saying, but I look at it a little bit differently. Meaning, part, sorry, so Albert says, which is what, what we're told in the Garden of Eden is the mission of Adam and Eve to work it and to preserve it. And that goes back to what Susan said in the beginning, where she said, it's to grow your own produce. It's to run your country. That's part of it. But I think that that's not the ultimate goal, but meaning according to God's command. Sorry, Ralph, say it again. But according to God's command. According to God's command. The according to the way he told us it should be run. Right. To run the land the way God told us to. If you read through Tanakh, you find a few different places in which the end game is described, in which God tells us what the goal is. And the goal is, as described, it's, it appears in Deuteronomy, it appears in Isaiah, it appears in a few places. The goal is to create a society in which we are aware of God and live, as Ralph said, a life which fulfills the commands that God has given. When we have that, then we will have bounty. We are promised that we will flourish. The nations will respect us. We will be protected from harm. That's what's supposed to happen. Now, Susan mentioned, and this was uh, what I was starting to respond to before, Susan also mentioned getting rid of the inhabitants. So the truth is that the plan as it's first presented is not to get rid of the inhabitants. That is what becomes the plan over the course of our travels in the wilderness. But as Rabbi Avram Cook explained, that's not what was supposed to be. The goal was that we enter the land with our Torah as models of people who have a connection to God, and we win over the inhabitants such that they want to live not necessarily a Jewish life. There's no requirement for them to become Jewish. However, for them to live the life that God wants of them, which is the seven Noahide laws, the seven universal laws that are meant for all of humanity. That's, what, that's what's supposed to happen. So we're supposed to convince them that that's what they want. If you take a look at source number five, I brought you the list of the seven universal laws. So six of them are prohibitions, and one of them is a commandment. So they're not supposed to commit murder. They're not supposed to commit adultery slash incest. Not supposed to worship idols. Idols, the definition in Judaism would be um, giving God a physical form, claiming that, uh, that there are multiple gods. The, there's more to be said about that, but not right now. Blasphemy against God is also prohibited. Theft. Eating flesh taken from a live creature. That one always confuses people because the first five seem like big things. And then you get to eating flesh from a live creature. Why would that one be on the list? Because hunting is the, the sacrifices that they did, that they ate, they sacrificed and they ate actual humans. No. So this isn't and about human beings. This is flesh from an animal it also. Was, no. It was a custom of the other peoples. The cruelty. So Don't one, we have one possibility is, to animals? Right. So one possibility is that this is about cruelty. It's trying to teach not to be cruel, to take flesh from an animal that's still alive. The other suggestion that I've seen is that it's because some of the rituals of idolatry involved taking something from a live creature. 
right? Mm. The um, so that's a uh, that's another possibility for where this where this comes from and why it was off limits. And then the last mitzvah is to establish a court system. Laws. These are what we're supposed to convince them to practice. The problem is that we failed on, on our way. We created the golden calf. We became less than full examples of what a religious life looks like. And so we stopped being convincing. And the result is that instead of it being come into the land and they see us and they say, we want that too. Instead, we come into the land and it ends up being war to eliminate those who will not follow these laws. Mind you, well, you only go in order. Take a look, first of all, at source number six, where God actually tells us this is why you're getting the land. He says in Deuteronomy chapter nine, not due to your righteousness and the straightness of your heart do you come to take their land. It's not that you're wonderful, but due to the wickedness of these nations does your God take <clears throat> them from before you and to uphold that which God swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're getting the land because... I need somebody to get rid of the immoral society that's there. And it might as well be you because I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that you could be in the land. So I'm giving it to you and telling you to eliminate the immorality that is currently there. And so you get what you see in source number seven, that before the Jews entered, Joshua sent three messages into Israel. Whoever wants to leave may do so. Whoever wants to make peace may do so, right? That's a fulfillment of the verse in source number eight, where you're supposed to call for peace. Whoever wants to make war may do so. Your choice, but we are, we are entering. So all of that is by way of background because Jericho is the first place where the Jews are going to have to fight. Jericho is where the battles begin. It is a mighty walled city, and we're going to talk about walled cities in a little bit. Um, and Jericho is also seen as emblematic of Canaanite society. Tell me something. What do we know about Canaanite cities from, from the Torah, from the beginning of the Torah, from the first book, from Genesis? What do we know about Canaanite cities? Can you give me an example of a Canaanite city depicted in the book of Genesis? Stone and Amora. Stone, right? Stone and Amora are examples of Canaanite cities, the place where, right, God says they have become so corrupt, people are suffering so much. And the example given is that when the visitors come to Lot's house, Right? They don't want the visitors to stay there. They want you to take, take them out and will abuse them. Right, That's an example of a Canaanite city in the Torah. Can you give me another example? The city of Shechem, right, where Dina is kidnapped and raped. Right? This is what we're told Canaanite cities are like. And Jericho is described in that way. Take a look, please, at source number nine. Source number nine introduces us to a woman by the name of Rachav. Rachav is described in Joshua chapter two as a zona. Zona is usually translated as a promiscuous woman, often one who is pro professionally so. The, um, it can also mean an innkeeper because mazon is food. So the truth of the matter is that sometimes you could be both. The, um, in other <laughs> words, somebody who ran the inn and provided meals also provided other services. So zona did not have to be one or the other, it could actually be both. But the Talmud in source number nine tells us about this woman named Rachav. She was a zona in the city of Jericho. There was not a single officer or leader who had not been with Rachav. Rachav was 10 years old when the Jews left Egypt. She was involved in Zinut, in being a Zona, for the entire 40 years during which the Jews traveled through the wilderness. 
This is the woman to whom the spies went when they came into Jericho. The best place to get information if all of the leading political officials go there. But tell me something. What's the subtext in this passage in source number nine? What is this telling us about the morality of the city? Yes, Rose. First of all, it was obviously completely immoral. Completely immoral. What I do you mean? mean? <coughs> it was uh, a with many people, with young people, children, uh, sexual <coughs> promiscuity. I mean, that's what it suggests to me. Right. So there, there are two things you see here, and I think you just caught, captured both, right? Number one, it's that this is a 10-year-old girl. A 10-year-old girl does not enter this profession by choice. The, this is a society in which she is put into that role. And look who the patrons are. Every officer and leader in the city. Now, the, we do not have evidence of this in the text, let's be clear. The, um, the only thing we know from the text that indicates this is number one, Rachav being identified as a Zona. And number two, the fact that the spies go there and she's able to tell them all about the morale of the city and the defense posture of the city, the, um, that gives us information, as well as the fact that when the king finds out that there are spies there and sends his men, his men know her and trust her. So when she says the spies already ran away, go you know, follow them that way, they all go. They, um, they listen to what she has to say. So she has a degree of credibility with them. So that supports this. But the, the, what the Talmud is doing is it's trying to say, this Jericho, this walled city, is a, is a city that lives down to what we, our greatest fears about Canaanites and their morality coming into the country. Are we clear? We good? Okay. So let's actually see the story of the battle. I broke it up into units to make it a little bit easier to digest. If you take a look at source number 10, this Rabbi, is the beginning of the story. Yes. Question, just going back to Zona for a moment. Sure. Um, if she was part of the group that left Egypt and traveled for 40 years in the no, desert. No, that's not what I'm saying. About age 50, how did she get into Jericho? Right, so she's not she's not Jewish. Rachav is from Jericho. She's not she's not a Jew. And she didn't no. travel with the Jews. No, no, no. The, I see why you would be confused because it makes reference to the Jews leaving Egypt. But yeah. what it's trying to do is give us the dates, and it's saying yeah. that she was already in this business when the Jews left Egypt, and that whole period of time, this is what she's engaged in. Yeah, no, she's a, a Jerichoite, I guess. I don't know what the term is for people from Jericho. I grew up not far from a city named Jericho, but um, I don't know. But, but yeah, that she, she was a native of the city, as far as we know. Yes, Marilyn, you're muted. You have to unmute. No, you turned off Can your video. Yeah, uh, she was a local. But she was totally immoral because she was a snitch as well. So that's an interesting question and not one that we're going to have time to go into. But if you listen to those recordings that I linked for you in source number four, I do discuss that question there. How do we view the fact that she supports the, uh, the spies and in fact, as we'll see, um, asks them to save her family? So how do we view that? Do we view it as betraying her city? Or do we view it as somebody who is so, um, not fed up is to, is to light a word, somebody who suffered in that city for 40 years and sees an opportunity now to get out of that with these Jews whose God she believes in, right? You could look at it in a lot of different ways. The, uh, Marilyn, we don't see you anymore. But um, but that's you know there are different ways you can look at it. If you go to those recordings, you'll see more uh, more about it in those discussions. Other questions before we start? Okay, so take a look at source number ten, Joshua chapter six, the beginning of the chapter. 
Now, Jericho was shut up tight. In the Hebrew, it's sogeret umisugeret, which is a double expression of being closed. The Hebrew word for a lockdown, anybody know? Sgira. Well, sgira the or seger. Sorry, what, Diane? I lost my train of thought. Oh, okay. But Seger is a lockdown in Hebrew. I was going to say lisgor. Is, it, is that the root? Right. Yes, that's the verb would be lisgor. The uh, the noun is a is a seger. So Jericho is described as sogeret umisugeret. The uh, it is completely locked down. Lisgor at hadelat. I remember. Yeah, exactly. You got it. No <laughs> one could leave or enter. The Lord said to Joshua. See, I will deliver Jericho and her king and her warriors into your hands. Let all your troops march around the city and complete one circuit of the city. Okay, everybody walks around the city. Do this six days with seven priests carrying seven ram's horns preceding the ark, the Aaron, the ark with the tablets in it. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the horns. And when a long blast is sounded on the horn, as soon as you hear that sound of the horn, all the people shall give a mighty shout. Thereupon the city wall will collapse and the people shall advance every man straight ahead. So you go around the city for six days. And then on the seventh day is when the action happens. So let me ask you, why are we going around the city for six days? Why not just cut straight to the chase? You know, why, who needs the six days first? Just to scare the, pop, the local population. So one view is indeed that this is intimidation. You have these people who are walk, walking around your city doing nothing, but looking very threatening. You're already afraid of them. It's gotta be intimidating. Interestingly, Others suggest, including Don Isaac of Barbanel, who had a history as a military advisor in part of his uh, part of his roles, says maybe it's the opposite. It's that it's to lull the people of Jericho and to think nothing is happening. Look, these Jews are camped there, but they just keep walking around the city. They're not finding a way in. We're good. They uh, that's an opposite way you could look at it. Yes, yeah, Susan. Could it be connected to this the week, like? God created the world in six Good. days on the seventh day. He rested, but here on the seventh day, we're going to attack. Right. Uh, so it's sort of a, a connection, but a little bit opposite. So we're going to come back to that in a moment. That's good. I just want to note one thing. Um, the way that this translation has it, the JPS translation that we're using here, it sounds like they only blow the horn on day seven. However, the classic commentaries read it that they're blowing the horn each day. They, um, and then you have this big thing that happens on day seven, just worth knowing. Okay, but now in terms of the significance of the seven, in addition to the possibility that it's an intimidation tactic, in addition to the possibility that it's just the opposite, that it's lulling the people of Jericho into thinking that they're safe, Take a look at that source number 11, Don Isaac of Barbanel, who picks up on this number seven and says, seven is a great number in Judaism. Because he writes, because just as the miraculous act performed by God in creation was done in six days, halting on the seventh day, so too to demonstrate to the nations and leaders that the conquest of Yericho, Jericho was a divine act, meaning marvelous and miraculous like the initial creation, he commanded that they make seven circuits in seven days with seven kohanim, seven priests, and seven shofarot, seven ram's horns, to hint that this deed would be of the same type as that first deed. The idea is to call back to creation, but he's not done. This was also the purpose and reason for the mitzvah of Shabbat. That's why you have a Shabbat, to commemorate that initial creation. And the sabbatical year, next year is a sabbatical year when you're not supposed to plant in, uh, in Israel. So every seven years you have that halting regarding which the Torah also says it's called a Shabbat for God, hinting at Shabbat of creation. 
and like the seventh day is one of rest and halting, and so those who engage in it will inherit land in which to con- on which to continue in the divine path. So he instructed them to have the whole nation blow on the seventh day, and the city would be conquered, and the Jews would have light, joy, celebration, and honor. He's borrowing from the book of Esther. He says that just like there is a reward for resting and halting on Shabbat and resting and halting in the sabbatical year, there will be a reward also for observing this seven-day period in going around Jericho. And not just that, but I know Susan's about to ask this question. Look at the next paragraph. Per the tradition of our sages, Israel began its circuits on the first day of the week, and the city was taken on Shabbat. The seventh day actually was Saturday. And thus it said, quote, on the seventh day, meaning the seventh of the week, the seventh of the circuits, as I have said. And he instructed them to blow the shofar like the deed of the Jubilee year every 50 years after the seventh of the sevens. And like in the sabbatical year for all of them to participate in a hint to creation by the divine will. It's all about a message of God creating the world. Yes, Susan. Um, you're muted. How come? Is this also where we learn that mitzvot, um, mitzvah is okay because on Shabbat? What do you mean? I mean, like when the Jews have to fight. Yeah. It's okay. Oh, you mean because they're fighting on Shabbat? I see what you mean. So yes. the um, if God tells them to, then they basically have no choice, meaning this is clearly something they're meant to do in the same way that God says bring sacrifices on Shabbat, even though that involves, you know, lighting a fire. They, I'm sort uh, of extrapolating for like the seven, like the wars that we've right. had to fight since we had Israel. Right. So the answer is that this is an example of it. I actually have something later on that relates back to it. So hang in there for that. Um, Mickey and then Rosalind. Yeah, this is so. Uh marvelous, wonderful reward. They get to slaughter every man, woman, child, and animal in the city. Correct. So this is the, this goes back to what I said in source number, not source number, the very beginning, at the top of the sheet, which is the um, this isn't going to be a series about the morality of war. That was something we did. We had this series in 2014, and the recordings are there. But if we discuss that, we're never going to discuss anything else. Oh. That's just the reality. I mean, that was a six-part series, um, and with good reason. So while I apologize, it's just not something we can fit into. Uh, can I just ask one question? Now. The um, there's just I, there's just no way. So you've raised an important question. It's just that I can't answer it in this venue right now. Roslyn is uh, is next up. Okay, actually, you answered the question because I was wondering why they were allowed to march or, to, or on, because one of those days would have had to be Shabbos. But, and you know, we are prohibited from uh, blowing the shofar when, you know, when, when it's on, when Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur is on Saturday. So, but you answered it that it was because it was God's will that they do this. The same, right? The same God who said observe Shabbat said, "I want you to do this right now." That's the, so. It's okay. Thank you. So it, it, we're going to come back to whether it's okay because it actually is going to play into a verse that's coming up um, in uh, in source number fourteen. So w- you'll see. There's there is more to say about this business of doing it on Shabbat. But in terms of the morality question, it's a big issue. It's a whole mini series and, and then some. Um, it's just not one that I'm gonna be able to, to tackle and do the battlefields as, as our discussion. So this is what they're told to do, emphasizing the sevens, linking this battle to creation. We're gonna talk about that more, but now take a look at the initial stages at what happened in source number 12. By the way, just in case anyone didn't didn't realize, you have the option on Zoom to raise your hand, not just like by going like this, but there's a choice at the bottom of the screen. I can't show it to you because as the host, I don't have it on mine, but, uh, but there's an option there for raise hand. And if you do that, then it puts your screen at the top of mine so I can see that you're waiting to ask a question. So it's on the chat for the people who have iPads. It's at the top of the chat. Okay. It's like where you go to your chat. Great. Thank you. 
So let's take a look at source number 12. Joshua, son of Nun, summoned the priests and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests carrying seven ram's horns precede the Ark of the Lord. And he instructed the people, go forward, march around the city with the vanguard marching in front of the Ark of the Lord. So the troops are walking around and the, uh, and the Ark is walking around and the priests carrying the horns are walking around. Marilyn, I see your hand, hang in there. When Joshua had instructed the people, the seven priests carrying seven ram's horns advanced before the Lord, blowing their horns. And the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. Notice that they're blowing the horns every day, not just in the, uh, not just in the, on the seventh day. The, um, I just lost my place. There we go. The vanguard marched in front of the priests who were blowing the horns. The rear guard marched behind the ark with the horns sounding all the time. But Joshua's orders to the rest of the people were, do not shout. Do not let your voices be heard. Do not let a sound issue from your lips until the moment that I command you shout, then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord go around the city and complete one circuit. Then they returned to camp and spent the night in the camp. So a day's work. Joshua rose early the next day. The priests took up the Ark of the Lord while the seven priests bearing the seven ram's horns marched in front of the Ark of the Lord, blowing the horns as they marched. Vanguard marched in front of them. Rear guard marched behind the Ark of the Lord. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to do. And if you're wondering why is the text bothering to tell me it, the answer is because we're so stunned that here you have the Jews doing what they were told to do. No, that's whatever. The... Um, <laughs> So they marched around the city once on the second day, returned to the camp. They did this six days. Marilyn, what was your question? I was just going to comment that this is done today, total strategic intimidation, because armies show their um, all their guns and their bombs, and they may not march around the city, but this is so common, total intimidation. Mm -hmm. I definitely hear the intimidation component. And take a look at source number 13. Rabbi Levi ben Gershon, writing in the 13th century, maybe into the 14th, I think he lives into the 14th, says there's another benefit to the whole silence thing. He says, so that the residents of the city did, uh, will not realize and hurl stones from the wall, meaning they don't know where you are. If as you march around the city, you're silent. And remember, they're in a walled city. They surely have lookout places. But most people in the city will not know where the Jews are. So although God could have guarded them from this miraculously, it is not the way of God to create miracles for naught where the goal can be accomplished in other ways. And that's a theme with Ral Bag, with Rabbi Levi ben Gershom. He has as a philosophy that miracles are kept to a minimum. And that's something that we're going to have to revisit not in this one, but when we talk about ILO and in the halting of the sun and the moon, that's where that's going to become relevant. Questions, or can we go to the next piece, source number 14? Okay, source number 14. On the seventh day, they rose at daybreak and marched around the city. In the same manner, seven times, that was the only day that they marched around the city seven times. On the seventh round, as the priests blew the horns, Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and everything in it are to be proscribed for the Lord. Only Rachab the harlot is to be spared and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers we sent. But you must beware of that which is proscribed. Proscribed in Hebrew is cherem, that which is off limits. The... Um, you will cause the camp of Israel to be proscribed. You will, I'm sorry, I jumped the line, or else you will be proscribed. If you don't stay away from that which is proscribed, you will be proscribed. If you take anything from that which is proscribed, you will cause the camp of Israel to be proscribed. You will bring calamity upon it. All the silver and golden objects of copper and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They must go into the treasury of the Lord. So the Mishkan, the tabernacle, is going to receive certain equipment and everything else is to be destroyed. And that takes me back to the question that a few people asked about Shabbat. There's a lot of discussion about why Joshua said that we weren't to take anything from the spoils. According to most commentators, God didn't tell him this. This was Joshua's own decision. And then the question is, well, why does Joshua give that? And one answer is because the prophets came from what they did on Shabbat, 
Therefore, he says, we can't benefit from it. Therefore, it all has to be off limits. Another view is to show that this isn't a, a standard war of conquest in which you're taking spoils. We don't want anything from them. That's not our goal. Our goal is to eliminate a city in which the leadership of the city would abuse a 10-year-old girl. That's what, we, that's what we're trying to, to do here. It's not about taking things for, for ourselves. Susan. Also, we have examples where they've had wars where God, God has said, don't take any shalom, you know, um, loot. Don't take any loot because, uh, and then it's explained what you just Correct. said. I mean, this is not the first, well, it is here, but afterwards it continues with that. Theme. So actually it's the other way around. Meaning, the um, biblically, going back to the Chumash, there are wars where we are told, don't take any. And some suggest that that's why Joshua issues the decree here, because he thinks it's the same. <clears throat> but this will not be true for the other wars, except against Amalek. Only against Amalek will we be told to, um, to not touch anything but otherwise not. Someone sent me a message in the chat. Normally I prefer for people to ask questions out loud, but I, I did notice it. Um, it is mentioned that God told the Jews what to do. Who is the conduit? Who gets God's messages? So that's actually a really important question beyond what we're talking about. If you were to look back in chapter five, you would find that some kind of angel or prophet spoke to Joshua right before this, right before the events of chapter six. And it's generally assumed that the messages he is getting are from that speaker, whoever that was in the end of chapter uh, of chapter five. Rose, you have to unmute. When Abraham had the war between the four kings and the five kings, he did not take the spoils. He refused to take the spoils. So sometimes you always, I don't know, if, sometimes things are foreshadowing, but it's a descendant. So we've learned that. That's what right. we, do. we do not do that unless there's a reason. So there, it's an interesting thing in terms of what Avram will take and won't take. Part of that is in his dialogue with the king of Sodom there. I don't want to go into the whole discussion about it, but you're right. We have precedent for saying it would be beneath <laughs> us to, uh, to take spoils. Okay. So this is day seven. The walls come tumbling down. Right, the wall collapsed. I thought about you know the recording playing. The walls come tumbling down, but this is the period on the Jewish calendar when I'm not listening to music as a you know, and and so I didn't. But you know the song. But take a look, please. It's source number fifteen. This is what Mickey was talking about. They exterminated everything in the city with the sword, man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey. But Joshua bade the two men who had spied out the land, go into the harlot's house, bring out the woman, all that belongs to her, as you swore to her, because they had sworn that they would protect her. So the young spies went in and brought out Rachav, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that belonged to her. They brought out her whole family and left them outside the camp of Israel. One thing that I'm not going to be discussing is the question of why they're called young spies. The Hebrew is ne'arim. The, um, it's not clear why they're suddenly identified that way. The, there are various commentaries on it, but it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about. Um, they burned down the city and everything in it, but the silver, gold, objects of copper and iron were deposited in the treasury of the house of the Lord. Only Rachav, the harlot, and her father's family were spared by Joshua, along with all that belonged to her, and she dwelt among the Israelites, as is still the case for she had hidden the messengers that Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. So there is a total destruction of this, uh, of this society. And again, it's never gonna make us feel comfortable with it. No matter how much we talk about the corruption of Jericho, you know, th the animals and children, yeah, it's still something very difficult and not something that, that this <laughs> class is gonna be able to, uh, to deal with at this time. Take a look at number 16, please. At that time, Joshua pronounced this oath. Cursed of the Lord be the man who shall undertake to fortify this city of Jericho. He shall lay its foundations at the cost of his firstborn and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest. Anybody attempts to rebuild this city will lose the family 
in the course of attempting to do so, starting with his oldest and working down to the youngest. Got it? So a few points here. First of all, what messages do you take away from this story? Meaning our first layer, right? We defined three layers that we want to see as we look at the um, as we as we look at these battlefields. The first is to see what people did, to learn about heroism, to learn about villainy, to understand what happened in the war. Then to talk about the meaning of the location itself, in this case, a walled city, and then to talk about the messages of the miracles that take place, in this case, the uh, the crumbling of the wall. The um, but let's talk about this the war itself, knowing we have four minutes left. Um, and I'll stay afterwards for a few minutes as always, you know, for, for questions and comments, but what messages do you see here? Yes, Paul. I don't know if that's putting up your hand. No, that's different. Okay. The, um, so I see a few things here. Number one, very important. Jericho has not done anything to us. This is not a war against attackers. We're going to see wars against attackers later on. But right now, this is not a war against somebody who has attacked us, enslaved us, oppressed us, whatever. We are the instigators of this war. Um, there is a mission here of the, instituting the culture which the Torah views as what everybody is supposed to accept, those seven universal laws that I listed for you in source number five. And that's the goal of this war. That's one message. Number two, it adds a religious dimension to the war. The fact that it's done with all of these sevens, right? The, um, the seven priests and the seven horns and going around the city seven times for seven days. The very fact that you have the priests acting in a leading role adds a religious dimension to the war. Now, the concept of holy war is one that we have a lot of issues with because in our world, we've seen holy war in the worst ways. The, um, but that's an undeniable dimension to what's going on here. This is a religious act. And third message, that God is going to support you with miracles. You don't need to win the war yourselves. You just do what God told you to do. Go around the city seven times, and then God will take care of the rest. Those are the things that, that those are messages that I see that emerge from the story. Anybody see anything else or have other questions about that? Oh, I got one. Yes. I think... Can you hear me? Yes. I think that it's major uh, military strategizing that we've used to this day, the Israeli army. It is, and it includes all the things that you have mentioned, but um, that's why we are such a terrific army because they strategize and they know what they're doing and they learn from what they don't do. I hear you. Is it called strategizing if God tells you what to do? But there's always a miracle or when we think about this, uh, the, the wars in Israel, to me, there was a miracle involved uh, as well. That as I definitely hear. Right. So, that yeah. I definitely hear. Yes. Okay. Um, Linda, Diane, and then Susan. Do we know if they were given the option to make peace? Yeah, that goes back to what I had brought you in the, um, which one was it? Source number seven, sources seven and eight. The Torah tells us when you approach a city to war, you first have to sue for peace. And Maimonides understands that that includes all wars, including these wars that God tells you to engage in. And in source number six, the Jerusalem Talmud explains that Joshua actually did this before they even crossed the Jordan. He sent these messages, messages saying, here are your options. So that's what we're being told, yes. Um, okay, uh, Diane and then Susan. Well, one thing I think the Israeli wars were not, were sort of miraculous, but mostly it was Israeli know-how. They knew what to do. They were prepared. They had soldiers who were I'll prepared. tell you what, I, I'm not going to go into a full thing on but this right now, but... But besides that, yeah. I was going to ask a question. Okay. The seven walking around seven times, and all that has to do with weddings, walking around mm. seven times, and the sure. Sheva Brachas for seven days. 
Good. So the seven for the Sheva Brachos are actually potentially something else. And that's really, you know, qu quite a discussion in its own right. Maybe after we uh, conclude this while I'm staying on, I'll, I'll expand on that. But I have seen it suggested that the bride walking around the groom seven times is the idea of building a wall for the family. The um, that, you know, sort of this was seven times I took down a wall. That's seven times to construct the wall surrounding the couple. So I have seen not that. Intimidating that, that the room? Hopefully not about intimidating him and knocking <laughs> down his walls. No, that was what dating was about. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm going to take Susan's question and then call it a day, but I'll stay on again. Yes, Susan. When they talk about, I mean, it's a very harsh punishment to build up your rico. Eventually they're going to, they're settling the land. I, I mean, are they supposed to leave it Pharaoh all this, all the years or like? Good question. And that's going to be our focus next time is this okay. business of not building it up and what that, uh, and what that means. So we are, we are going there. So God willing, next time we will complete our discussion of Jericho and start on our discussion of, um, of Ayalon which is a fascinating story. I think it's safe to say that what I said in the beginning is true, that we're not gonna to get to the Mount of Olives, but I, I knew that. I just liked the story and I was hoping, but but I'd rather we do four stories well than uh, rather than, than race through in order to say we covered five. So this is uh, a good start for me and I hope that you'll stick with the series. I'll send out an email later with follow-up. I'm gonna turn off the recording and I'll stick around for a few minutes um, to discuss further, I wanted to revisit Diane's point, certainly. Thank you.